our home. And they don't understand that this is a home for a whole bunch of people down here. You know, and they cannot take this away and give it to some guy who's going to park his yacht over here and drink martinis. F*** that. On this little sign here, it says, yachts don't feed people. You know, that's true, they don't. Yachts feed ego. <laughs> we don't need that down there. We're fishermen, let's keep it for fishermen. Fishermen only. Well, what you hear is this kind of oil and vinegar. They're asking us to, to let the, those uh, leisurely rich people mix with those who are really working. You know, I would say it's a mischaracterization. We're trying to enhance revenue so we can support the fishing fleet. This is a home today for a thousand fishermen and thousands of workers. And if the port puts yachts into the home port of the North Pacific Fleet, you are declaring war on the working class of Seattle. And to be totally honest, we will fight you. We will fight you at the zoning level. We will fight you in the mayor's office. We'll fight you at the city council and we'll fight you in front of the voters. We can find a way to have fishing people here and fishing people bump pleasure boats. All in favor, please say aye. 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 The resolution 3480 passes. Every year, fishermen from Seattle travel to Alaska in search of fish. About 40% of the wild seafood caught in the U.S. comes from boats that moor at the terminal. Fishman's Terminal, it's one of those iconic places for uh, the city of Seattle. It's home to many of the boats whose needs drive a lot of the local economy. It's in a maritime area that has been maritime since uh, the Whites have been in Seattle. My great-grandfather had one of the first boat building shipyards right by the Ballard Bridge in 1900, 1905. That side of the family's been into the fishing business for a long time. Pete Knudsen is a commercial fisherman who also teaches anthropology at a local community college. He often brings his students down to the terminal to learn about its history and development. These docks are all new, these cement floating docks. In 2001, when the port decided to allow pleasure boats into Fisherman's Terminal, he was one of the leading voices in the community opposing the port's plan. The issue was never really yachts versus working people. The real deal was to open up this area for real estate development. The yachts were just like a wedge issue to bring them in. If you travel on the American East Coast or anywhere in coastal America, what you see is gentrification everywhere. And this is how it starts. They started doing studies whose purpose was to determine what is the highest and best use of this area. And and that's really, you know, a hard question to ask because highest and best use in real estate uh, is not the highest and best use for the community. It was a great uh, boom in real estate at that point. Everybody wanted to be a developer and that was uh, as true of the port as it was for anybody else. In the port they were desperately trying to get big real estate projects underway. Yes, you can flip a property for more immediate profit if you turn it into condos, but in the end, that's not going to be the same kind of economic generator as if you were to um, build a hardware and fishing supply store there. What the Port of Seattle was doing was reevaluating all of what they consider their real estate portfolio in terms of its value on the market. The port acts as if this is just their property. This is not their property. 
they are a caretaker of a public trust. In 1911, the Port of Seattle was established to manage the waterfront in the public interest. As part of this mission, the port built Fisherman's Terminal to serve as a lasting home for the fishing fleet. These are pictures of Fisherman's Terminal in 1914. Commercial fishermen really are what started Fisherman's Terminal and why we're here. We still have a lot of work going on today. It looks a little different than this. We don't have as many wood boats as we used to have, but I think that our guys work just as hard as they did uh, 100 years ago. The reason Fisherman's Terminal is still here was not because of uh, institutional pressure was because of public pressure. The port was putting lots of money into yacht harbors. They had redeveloped Shill Shoal Marina twice. The port knew that Fisherman's Terminal produced 5,000 jobs and hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue, but they hadn't reinvested down here. And so in the early 2000s, this place was collapsing. If you looked around here, you had pilings broken off everywhere. Uh, you had ancient wooden docks that were built in 1940. It was the year that Hitler invaded Norway. That's how old it was. This was like the beginning of World War II. If you came down on my boat 10, 12 years ago, there'd be a, a little tippy, basically log raft to walk on. And then where you tied your boat up, you'd have to hop on the bow of the boat um, because there wasn't any side tie you know, where you could come on the boat. And so, like when it was, when it'd be icy in the winter, guys would try to jump on their boat and they would miss and slip. I mean, it was like a disaster. This is where he fell in right here. And tonight, a flower memorial sits at the end of Dock 6 at Fisherman's Terminal. Around Christmas, 42-year-old fisherman Kip Gilbart died after he fell off the dock and drowned in the cold waters. Oh hey my God, the poor man was in the water for three weeks where they found him, you know. I fish in Alaska and I fish down here, and when I get home, I want to be able to think that this is my safe haven, but when I, when I see that there's people that die down here on the docks, that's, it makes me question, you know, how safe a, a place this is. The court statement was that uh, this guy had just drifted in from the canal and they called him a drifter. The family assumed that he was uh, already in Alaska and here the port was saying he was homeless and he was just wandering around and he came from somewhere else. He wasn't related to Fisherman Terminal. It's really uh, pretty insulting not only for the fishermen to hear that about a fellow fisherman but also for their family. The death of Kip Gilmartin was the first of four deaths at Fisherman's Terminal during the winter of 2006. God's blessed us with a community of people willing to go to sea and be productive. All of us benefit from their brave work. Since the last blessing of the fleet, I've heard of more people being lost here at Fisherman's Terminal than in the North Pacific. It's right for us, I think, to do all that we can to ensure their safety at sea and right here on these docks at Fisherman's Terminal. The news Friday of the deaths of two people here were shocking to us all. Uh, our thoughts are with their families now and we're very sorry for their loss. At this point, there's no indication uh, that the deaths were due to unsafe conditions here on the terminal, but we want Fisherman's Terminal to be safe and a good place to do business.
After the deaths, the Department of Labor and Industries conducted an investigation into the safety conditions on the docks. The State Department of Labor and Industries came in, low lighting levels, ladders that didn't reach the water, electrical boxes not protected, you know, problems with the docks, slippery surfaces. The investigation determined the port had exposed its employees and fishermen to dangerous conditions, including the hazards of drowning. In the end, the port was fined $2,200 for safety violations. If someone would have fallen off a Holland America cruise ship or at, at their dock, it would, have been, it would have been huge coverage. But they've got a huge PR department. Their whole job is to smooth the press and finesse and spin and, and keep, keep out of public consciousness things they don't want out there. I've never seen another state agency that has the kind of insulation from accountability these guys have. Unbelievable. They were found there, we don't know how they ended up in the water. You don't either. Oh yes, I have a damn good idea how they ended up in the water. I have a damn good idea how they ended up in the water. I mean, respect them. You know. Nobody saw them? Yeah. Nobody was there? Oh, that's right. Yeah, and maybe the sun won't come up tomorrow either. You, you're not a fisherman. You haven't been down here. You know, you spin this stuff for the press and try to minimize the damage for the port. That's all you're trying to do down here, David. You know, and then you say there's no evidence they fell off. How do you think they all ended up in the water? What do you think happened? I don't know what happened. Oh, no, just, uh, well, maybe they dropped from an airplane. Huh? Come on. I mean, you know, that's absurd. Well, how else could they have gotten water? They fell. They fell off the dock. What do you think happened? Did they fall from a boat? What? The boat? Maybe between the dock and the boat? Yeah. You know, if you go out to Shilshaw, how do you get on a boat? You got side tie. You can walk down and go over the bulwark. Here, what, how do you get on the boat here, David? You got to jump. You got to jump. I'm not interested in being it's filmed. It's dangerous, man. Um, you know? I don't want to make the next dock never important, Larry, so I'm going to step out of the picture. The port began replacing the old docks in 2007. With the new docks came other changes at Fisherman's Terminal. In an effort to attract more upscale tenants, the port proposed new rules banning fishermen from living on their boats year-round. I've got the latest quote from Mark Knudsen. How can I bring in million and a half dollar vessels when they're going to have to tie up next to these scruffy guys? That's the justification for his liveaboard policy, which clearly is about making the terminal comfortable for wealthy people. I've been here since I was eight years old. Now you're telling me I have to change my career, I have to leave my port of call that I've been in for how long? Because I can't live here anymore? That's 42 years I've been here. Who are you? You just got here, in my opinion. You want to save lives? Make a way to get up out of the water. What also was going on at Fishman's Terminal is that, I mean, it's a really eclectic cast of characters. I mean, these people um, had known each other for a long time. There were some people living aboard the boats who had a party-oriented lifestyle. It's not unusual at marinas. And kind of becoming at, at odds with those people, um, the port began to make moves which would have severely uh, and negatively impacted all of the good, honest, hardworking fishermen who are really the lifeblood of Fishman's Terminal. And so they allowed their conflict with a fringe element uh, within the Fishman's Terminal to corrupt their support for uh, the larger um, community. We wouldn't be discussing the liveaboard policy if four people hadn't died this winter. And when I read the paper yesterday, and I see Mark Knudsen saying they made poor lifestyle choices. These people have families, Mark, and they read this. And that, you should resign from making that kind of statement. You know, when you talk about drug paraphernalia on the docks down here, when you say, we are not upstanding citizens, you know, that's defamation. I don't drink or smoke, and I've been on boats. I've lived on them since I was 19 in ports as diverse as Uniclete, Alaska, and San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco, you name it. What uh, comes out in newspaper articles and various sound bites and quotes don't represent my position. 
in the context of my comment, was not about fishermen, was not about the borders. It was about some people that have uh, have been down here around this terminal that uh, that are different than that than that group. After this meeting, the port backed down, allowing fishing vessel owners and crew to live on their boats. The port continued with its plan to increase revenue by attracting more pleasure craft to the terminal. The way the port is being run, we're subsidizing to massive degrees the cruise industry. On one hand, they're subsidizing the cruise industry and they're like, oh, but it's great for the town. On the other hand, they're subsidizing Fishman's Terminal and they're saying, well, we can't really do this anymore. It's just draining our coffers. And so uh, they began to remake uh, the docks into uh, docks that could handle larger boats uh, with an eye towards you know, more commercial luxury boats. Did you have fun, honey? <laughs> We've been fighting for new docks, and we finally got the new docks. And now the cruise lines are coming in, taking up the space. It looks to me like the cruise lines are taking advantage of everything that we had to fight for. This is what we were worried about happening when we were fighting the yachts being put in. We knew the next step would be cruise ships, and here they are. We weren't crazy. <laughs> Ooh. Nope. <laughs> it's one person's recreation versus other people's livelihoods. So, you know, that's, that's kind of a traditional part of the city. I mean, I was born here. And that's something I associate with Seattle. Never really associated, uh, you know, like the high glamorous life, I guess, you know? Yeah. So, always, uh, you know, utility and livelihood over recreation and pleasure, I guess. So. I just noticed it the other day when I was having lunch. It's like they used to have all the bumper stickers up above the grill there. It said, you know, this place is supported by fishing dollars. That's all gone. Almost every reference to fishing is out of there. And it's like, you know, just be a backdrop, you know. Put these boats out here as, you know, so the tourists can look at them, but don't actually do anything that will offend them, you know. You can't make everybody happy when you're doing the good of the, the greater. The port has invested over $60 million in the infrastructure here. We do have a commitment from our elected officials that we are the home port of the North Pacific Fishing Fleet, and that is our mission, and that's what we work towards every day. The prices are still pretty good there as compared to many other marinas. Um, there's a reason why the boats are still there, because it's the best deal they can find. So it's not a totally broken relationship. It's working. It's working as, it, as we speak. one part of the story that's never told or had much visibility, and that is during the economic downturn in 2008, leading all the way up until like last year, the fishing industry continued to thrive. One of the biggest uh, changes I've seen in the last couple years, the surge in the fishing industry, how many people are building new boats, replacing engines on their boats. The industry is so strong right now, it's fantastic. And that is sustainable, and it has been that way for over 100 years. Even though it had some dips, it's corrected itself, and it's thriving, and it's vibrant once again. Look at all the jobs that are coming out of this place. It's bustling. It's busy. There's going to be a life to this facility of 40, 50 years, and it's going to bring billions into the economy. And this is billions that taxes will be paid on, unlike Boeing. You know, Boeing gets $8 billion of tax subsidy. Well, we're not Boeing, we're the home team here. We're not gonna go to South Carolina, we're staying here. This is one of the few working fishermen's terminals in the United States that allows public access. That means you get to bring your kids, show them what it's all about, show them how fish is caught, show them where it comes from, make them think about it in a sustainable way, and know what it means to our future. I don't want to be mayor four years from now where we simply have condos where there was once a maritime industry. I want to be mayor four years from now that actually has a maritime industry. Think of this as just the first century of Fisherman's Terminal. Next century is going to be just as bright. 
We're fishing in Alaska and we're fishing in the North Pacific, but we're living and creating jobs and wages right here in Seattle, Washington. If the politicians want to carry the flag and be in the forefront and claim that they're behind the terminal, then more power to them. But gentrification is happening everywhere. And there's always people who are looking for new profit-making opportunities to convert public spaces into private gain. This battle over redevelopment, it's going to come back. It is what it is. It's just uh, it's economics. Personally, I don't think it'll be like this 50 years from now. Personally, I think there'll be some very well-to-do people living on this property right here where they're both tied up in front of them. We are in a point in time in which the tide has turned, and that's great. Um, but at some point, the tide will turn the other way, and then we're, we're going to have to be uh, vigilant. That's uh, Emerald City, the Wizard of Oz, the Yellow Brick Road, where the Munchkins live. <laughs>